So I want to begin by thanking the Anne Tannenbaum Center for Jewish Studies and especially its director, Anna Sternschuss, for this wonderful invitation, and to Lauren Fidewa for exp expertly helping me with the setup and preparations for this broadcast. As someone living very much within the orbit of Toronto and with my own history at the University of Toronto, I follow your impressive programming closely and have watched from afar the Center for Jewish Studies grow and thrive over the years. So it's a great honor to be included in your speaker lineup. And it also holds a special significance for me because the Center for Jewish Studies played an absolutely key role in supporting me as an early career scholar by bringing me to Toronto many years ago as a Ray D. Wolf Fellow, an experience that had a big impact on my own scholarly orientation. So I feel quite tied to the enterprise of Jewish studies as it is carried out at Toronto to this day. I wanna send a special greeting to the members of the graduate seminar of the collaborative program in Jewish studies, which I understand meets concurrently with this speaker series. Being located at McMaster University and thus in the orbit of Toronto, as I said, it's always a special pleasure to find out about students coming up through that program. It's most unfortunate that my lecture can't involve meeting and being in conversation face to face, but please know that I would be very happy anytime in the future to be contacted and to be in conversation about shared academic interests and about our cross-disciplinary field of Jewish studies. There is a handout for this lecture. Uh, I believe that uh, a link has been sent to you so you can either download and print the file so that you can look at any part of it any time during the lecture, and I'll refer to the numbered passages as I speak. And I will also shortly display parts of the handout on screen as I get to specific passages that I'm drawing on. At the center of this lecture is the fact or idea of a law prohibiting blasphemy, the idea of offense against the sacred or offense against religion. Today, the notion of blasphemy has become a touchstone for thinking about whether a religious group or sensibility must be protected from defamation or insult. Here, the question of minority religions attracts special attention, and the question of blasphemy becomes a question of how minority religious or cultural sensibilities are to be taken account of in public space, a question that is often framed in terms of accommodation or tolerance. But as I will be showing, the use of blasphemy laws for the supposed protection of minority religions, though it in some ways appears to us a new concern or topic, is, for example, in German legal culture, a relatively old practice. In ways that were actually non-controversial at the time, Jews in the late 19th century and up until 1933 were using the German statute prohibiting offense against a religion, section 166 in the German criminal code, which we will look at in a bit, for the purpose of combating anti-Semitism by legal means. This was one of many types of advocacy that Jews engaged in to further solidify their place in German civil society. The last part of my talk will briefly discuss a particular legal proceeding, the Marburg anti-Semitism trial of 1888, in which the German Jewish neo-Kantian philosopher Hermann Cohen served as an expert witness, his testimony being what led me to the topic of blasphemy law in the first place. Cohen's participation in this trial turned out to be very significant for his thought, as in the affidavit that he submitted to the court and published immediately as a pamphlet, he developed his ideas about the meaning of love of neighbor in German Nächstenliebe in Judaism, which became a re recurring topic in his writings. My very open-ended question is, how might looking at the past exploitation of secularized blasphemy law in the service of Jewish legal defense and anti-defamation, alongside ongoing debates about whether religions can be objects of protection under the law, be mutually informative? That is, how can looking at that past experience with blasphemy law and anti-defamation help us to think about current scenarios surrounding blasphemy in relation to past scenarios, and also to think about how we both perceive and forget the continuities between them? My inquiry is still preliminary, not a full-fledged final research report. This is in part due to a methodological challenge that I encounter in pursuing this line of inquiry, which requires moving among disciplinary domains that are normally not in contact with one another. And I actually think that taking note of this methodological situation helps us understand the topic and nature of the inquiry I have in mind. And I'm going to begin sharing my handout.
So as you'll see under number one, I have here four domains of scholarship that I view as relevant to the study of secularized blasphemy. The first is cultural, religious, political history, which studies blasphemy in historical and contemporary perspective. It's the history of what has been called blasphemy and how that notion of an offense against God or against the sacred or against religion has evolved in view of what is generally called the secularization of the state or of political authority. The second domain of scholarship is legal scholarship, in particular criminal jurisprudence and legal history. This field looks at criminal statutes and tries to account for how they got there, why they are there, and how they work to realize specific juridical goals, and sometimes in order to develop arguments for changing those, those laws. Besides criminal law, a further area of the law that is relevant to my inquiry is religion law. And in the German context, there's an older name, although it's still prevalent in, uh, for some, um, which is Staatskirchenrecht. I've put that word there because the domain of religion law is originally, and uh, in some ways ongoingly, um, concerned with the position of the church in relation to the state. So it's state church law. The third area of scholarship I mentioned is the study of Jewish legal defense or anti-defamation and in general of Jewish responses to anti-Semitism. Here we find studies of the historical phenomena I just mentioned of Jews using laws such as six, section 166 to help bring about prosecution for public anti-Semitic speech. This scholarly literature focuses on the era by which Jews had gained full rights as citizens and documents the various ways in which Jews and also non-Jews produced publications, engaged in political and journalistic activities, and developed legal strategies in order to combat anti-Semitic agitation. Since 1945, one thing you see a lot in this literature, focusing particularly on the Wilhelmine and Weimar eras, is framing questions of the type, did this work? Were the strategies and the me mechanisms of anti-defamation successful? And why or why not? These questions fit in with a catalog of research questions that dominated historical inquiry after 1945 about why National Socialism rose to power and why the crimes against Jews, other minorities, and political opponents of Nazism could take place. An interest in understanding the success and failure of the struggles against anti-Jewish activity, of course, has also guided work in modern Jewish history that is tied to questions of Jewish existence. The fourth area of scholarship I want to mention is the contemporary, often polemical discussions about the presence of minority religions, notably Islam in majority Christian, albeit ostensibly secularized, polities. In this context, we have the very heightened discourses about what constitutes tolerance, what constitutes respect, what constitutes integration or accommodation of the religiously other. In that framework, there is a routine concern or panic about the question, is offense against a religion permitted? Is there a right or a freedom to offend? Looking at these four domains of inquiry, there are, of course, some overlaps among them, but significantly from my topic, the second, the last two, history of anti-antisemitism and the study of the place of minority religions, rarely connect with the second, the legal scholarship. In other words, when the historian of Jewish anti-defamation surveys the range of activities Jews engaged in in response to anti-Semitism, they don't st typically study the legal history of the statutes under which, for example, anti-Semites were taken to court, or look at the re legal rationale behind those statutes. And for the most part, legal historians or scholars of criminal law who look at the history and current rationales for blasphemy laws, such as Section 166, don't consider the history of when and how specific statutes became available for the so-called protection of minority religious entities or at how they were actually used to that end. Effectively, the discussion and the legal scholarship posits as its primed backdrop a secularization process by which religion, that is, church authority, became progressively less important in the state and asks about blasphemy law as a waning or a vestige of that process about it, which it can then be asked, why do we still have such a law? The plurality or pluralization of religions rarely makes an appearance or as a factor in such discussions. And if it does appear, 
it is as an addendum or an anomaly to the main line of the narrative. Thus, the, the norm for understanding the public political significance of religion, as defined, for example, by the very name Staatskirchenrecht, state church law, is given in the state's relationship with its recognized churches, so that it is only subsequently that it is asked, how is that relationship changed by the presence always conceived as new, a new presence or an arrival of entities that also claim the title religion or which we also designate by the title religion. I hope that the account I will offer here of secularized blasphemy law in conjunction with some analysis of an anti-Semitism trial that took place in a past era under more or less the same law that exists in Germany today can also be a case in point for why one might want to approach religion law by beginning from the scenarios that have to do with the presence of the so-called minority religions. I see this work therefore as being in line with the fruitful discussion that has been taking place in the study of religion that challenges the idea that there is on the one hand religion or religiosity as such and on the other hand a secularity that would be its supposedly culturally neutral and timeless counterpart. Before turning to modern contexts, I'll begin by just mentioning some scriptural basics about the notion of blasphemy so that we can have in mind where this word or idea comes from. The words blasphemy and the German Gotteslästerung evoke momentous offenses with fearsome consequences. They refer originally to an offense of biblical origin, offense, an offense against God, and in particular, a profanation of God's name upon which God decrees a punishment of death. And you can look at number two on the handout. In the originary instance in Leviticus 24, we are told of a man whose mother was an Israelite and whose father was an Egyptian, who comes out among the people of Israel and in a fight with a certain Israelite, blasphemed the name in a curse. I added some of the Hebrew so that those who are interested can see that the verbs that came to be rendered as blasphemy are nun, Kuf bet and kuf lamed lamed, roots. This man is brought to Moses and is held until the decision should be made clear. God's punishment communicated to Moses is death, death by stoning to be carried out by the entire congregation. From which issues the general decree, one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. The Greek terms blasphemein, blasphemia, and the adjective blasphemos are used throughout the New Testament. They're used especially in accusations against Jesus and against Christians, and you can look at number three on the handout. A different sort of use is when Jesus refers to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, as in the second instant under number three. According to the Catholic theologian Ludwig Schick, both types of usage in the New Testament have an ambivalence to them. That is, unlike what one might expect from Latter-day usages, blasphemy is in the first instance a word put into the mouths of those who denounce Christians. And in the second instance, blaspheming the Holy Spirit is not a crime that is subsequently to be punished, but is characterized as being already its own punishment. In other words, if Schick is right, these verses don't indicate a crime of blaspheming the Christian God, and they don't refer to a crime for which either a believer or a non-believer makes themselves punishable in the here and now. If we look and uh, now under number four, at novel 77 of the Code of Justinian, that body of laws that forms the backbone of Roman civil law concerning blasphemy, we see that it consists of two steps. The first step is, and I'm quoting now, and since some men, aside from the acts just mentioned, use blasphemies and swear oaths by the deity, thereby inciting the wrath of God, we also call upon them to abstain from such blasphemies. We therefore exalt all such men to abstain from the sins mentioned, to have in mind the fear of God, and to imitate those who live uprightly. For famine and earthquakes and pestilences are caused by such sins, and we therefore admonish them to refrain from the crimes mentioned, lest they lose their souls, unquote. So that's, first of all, the idea that blasphemy is just directly punished by God. The second step is represented in the, second, in the last sentence, quote, and if there are any who persevere in such iniquity after this, our admonition, they in the first place show themselves unworthy, unworthy of the clemency, unquote. So here, 
human punishment is being given as a supplement or a backup to divine punishment, but the offense remains basically predicated on divine punishment and not human punishment. With the growing political power of the church, which claimed to be the realization of God's power on earth, the state took on, a more, on more directly the task of protecting the Christian faith and the doctrine of the church. The religious crimes, delicta ecclesiastica, as set out by canon law, which included heresy, apostasy, and the like, along with blasphemy, and enforced by the church, became the basis for this state enforcement. And eventually, the state came to develop its own independent criminal laws against blasphemy. Historians of blasphemy law point to the contrast between Justinian's novel 77 that we just looked at and about 1,000 years later, the edict of Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian I against blasphemy, that was in 1495, which explicitly renews the prohibition as given in Justinian. However, in Maximilian's edict, we no longer find that the element, um, that element of blasphemers bringing divine punishment on themselves. Instead, it includes a catalog of severe human punishments, depending on the circumstances of the offense and the status of the offender. From that, we take a historical leap to the modern day question, what is the crime of blasphemy in the context and legal culture of secular democracy? A couple of caveats about how I'm posing this question. I'm talking about the secular, secular democracies in the formerly Christian West and not, for example, countries in which Islam is the politically dominant or determinant re religious tradition. Obviously, a treatment of how blasphemy law works in a country like Pakistan or Indonesia would have to be a separate endeavor. And second, my discussion draws on the German-speaking context, but I believe it is relevant broadly to Western secular democracy, both in points in which other systems might be similar and in points where their legal cultures contrast with the German one. I'd like to begin by approaching this question by looking at an aspect of how classic modern German criminal law theory conceives of criminal statute, to, to the best of my understanding, as an outsider to that field. And I refer you here to uh, number five on the handout. The question that criminal, uh, German criminal law theory classically asks is, what is the object of protection? What is the Rechtsgut? So about this term, um, this term is often also translated into English as legal goods. And it represents a decisive enlightenment era innovation in the theory of criminal law. Departing from earlier conceptions of crime as a transgression against the divine law or a natural law, this new definition of crime originated in the idea that norms, represented by statutes and criminal codes, are human-made. But criminal law theory still needed a general overarching concept of crime as such to legitimate the very existence and overall objective of penal law. Such a general concept was initially supplied by the idea that a crime represents a breach or a threat to the social contract or social order, or a threat to the securing of the maximal mutual freedom of all citizens. Later on, a theory was developed that tried to specify further what exactly is injured or harmed when a crime is committed. For example, if we were to say that what makes a crime a crime is that it attacks someone's rights or someone's interests, that might be too broad or vague, given that those rights or interests remain intact after the crime has happened. This was an era in which law was being newly defined in positivist terms, breaking with definitions of crime as a violation of something like the victim's freedom or the good of society. A positivist approach to law avoids relying on notions such as freedom, societal good, that transcend the law itself. So criminal statutes would need to be describable in ways that are not informed by a principle external to law. The name Rechtsgut, legal good then, was introduced to designate precisely that which must be shown to have been harmed in order for the corresponding crime to, have, to be deemed to have taken place. This Rechtsgut must be an object that is protected by the state. So, for example, life can be understood to be the legal good that the state protects through its laws prohibiting murder, among others. Similarly, state laws protect goods such as bodily integrity, freedom of movement, property, or public safety. In the case of a law prohibiting blasphemy, 
or the defamation of religion. Enlightenment thinking transformed blasphemy from a crime against God to a crime against humans. The object of protection came to be the citizen in some sense that needs to be specified. As the state came increasingly to be an authority apart from that of the church, the idea that state law ought to criminalize the insult of God or of religion became less certain. Some, such as Wilhelm von Humboldt, developed arguments that are quite familiar to us today, that the state must refrain from penalizing statements about religion or morality. Two contemporaneous Enlightenment era innovations can be seen at this stage to be connected. The first innovation is this theory of the Rechtsgut, of what can be a legitimate or coherent object of protection. That theory is meant to avoid conceiving a crime too broadly in a way that risks referring to a tra transcendent source of law. The second Enlightenment innovation is that the religious crime, the religious offense, that class of crimes under canon law that includes blasphemy, at least initially and in some places, comes to be seen as a non-crime on the ground that it lacks a legitimate object of protection. Religiosity is now considered to be transcendent in the sense of belonging to, to the sphere of the self, and this self is constituted as having autonomy and judgment. The self of autonomy and judgment, that self to which religiosity pertains, transcends the, fra the frame of law. It's outside law in the positive sense, in the positivist sense. In other words, both modernizations, the modernization of the criteria for what constitutes a crime in general, and the modernization, which was actually the elimination of the notion of the crime of blasphemy, can be understood as reflecting the need to remove the constitutive reference to something transcendent. The impact of this changed thinking was that in the late 18th and early 19th century, a number of important codes either eliminated this crime entirely or radically downgraded it. A famous instance is the Criminal Code of Bavaria of 1813, authored by Paul Johann Anselm von Feuerbach. This was the most noteworthy instance of a criminal code that was wholly conceived out of enlightenment and in particular Kantian philosophical principles. With this code, Bavaria became the only German jurisdiction in which there was no punishable offense of blasphemy, though it still contained a specific statute aimed at preachers who incited hatred against another religion. Feuerbach's justification for this was, in line with the requirements of Rechtsgut theory, that God cannot be injured. God cannot be an object requiring protection under criminal law. Similarly, the French Code Penal of 1810 contained no crime of, no crime of blasphemy. However, in the course of the following decades, a new stringency regarding blasphemy arose in key criminal codes. In France, the crime of blasphemy was reintroduced in 1819 and actually became punishable by death as of 1825. And several German criminal codes also introduced more robust blasphemy statutes. The general tendency was to justify this reintroduction of the blasphemy crime by arguing that offending or attacking religion amounted to attacking at least immediately state authority as well and thus was a threat to public order. Of greatest ongoing relevance for German jurisprudence is the blasphemy statute introduced as section 135 of the Prussian Criminal Code of 1851, which appears under number six on the handout. Since that became the basis of the blasphemy statute in the Criminal Code enacted in 1871 for the unified German Reich, there it's numbered 166 and is commonly referred to in German as the Gotteslästerungsparagraph, and that's number six and seven on your handout, which I'll scroll to in a moment for those who are watching. In its German, in its wording from 1871, section 166 stayed in force in the Federal Republic all the way up to the criminal law reform of 1969. So that's in handout seven, both versions. Politically speaking, in place of enlightenment teachings centered on the rational and morally improvable subject, what comes to the fore with these more stringent blasphemy laws introduced in the 19th century and effective into the 20th century is a view that religious adherence, religious allegiance, 
must be secured in the service of securing the authority of the state. In particular, religion was being bolstered as a way for the state to hold liberal democratic challenges in check. This new stringency is often seen as typifying the tendencies of counter-enlightenment, reaction, or restoration. In the terms of Rechtsgut theory, we can say that the object of protection of the new secularized blasphemy laws was religion, and that to protect and preserve religion and respect for religion had come to be seen as an interest of the state. In other words, in this modern age, for religion to be an object of protection means something quite different from the rationale for protecting God or the sacred that underlies pre-modern blasphemy laws. If one looks at the recast blasphemy law of the mid 19th century from the point of view of Rechtsgut theory, one also finds an additional object of protection, the religious feelings of the believers. Again, in place of the classic enlightenment view of the subject as free, and is obliged to exercise his freedom of judgment without being beholden to any external authority, now there is a more romantic, anti-rationalist valorization of feeling. Here we can be re reminded of Friedrich Schleiermacher's famous definition of religion in which feeling was the central term. But just as was the case for religion as an object of protection, religious, for religion as a, an object of protection, religious feeling, was an intermediate object of protection in that protecting the believer's religious sensibilities was seen as a further way of protecting the state. As one critical jurist writing in Germany in 1908, looking at these historical underpinnings of section 166 remarked, it is ironic that religion had once again become an instrument of control. For pre-modern pre contexts, it's often said that religious authority closely allied with the state held sway over what people professed to believe. But now, the very autonomy of the subject to be a believer, the capacity accorded to him of being a potential bearer of religious feeling, likewise becomes an, albeit mediated, means of state control. The state, through the blasphemy statute, protects the believer's feelings in order to secure itself. This has consequences, I believe, for secular modernity as well, as to this day, laws pertaining to religious observance or religious freedom routinely posit a believer or adherent who is conceived in certain terms. So it is too with the statutes criminalizing blasphemy. As Talal Assad writes in his 2008 essay, Reflections on Blasphemy and Secular Criticism, written in the wake of the Danish Muhammad cartoons crisis of 2005, Historically, the crime of blasphemy was entangled with the question of political toleration and the formation of secular modernity. The 19th century trajectory from abolition to reintroduction of the crime of blasphemy provides a useful reminder that if we want to trace something called secularization in the history of modernity, we must not imagine it to be a straightforward and continually intensifying development in the direction of one type of constellation or arrangement of religious things in relation to putatively non-religious things. Under the heading of modernity or secularization in the West, we might find quite diverse sorts of arrangements and sequences of arrangements. In the history of section 166, two modern ideas apparently led successively to two different outcomes. The idea that state authority can be separate from religious authority led in the 1813 Bavarian Criminal Code and elsewhere, to freeing the state of its obligation to protect religion, and correspondingly, to considering the religious individual is sufficiently free to have no need for such protection and even is obligated to not require it. The second idea that individual subjects are autonomous and thus also free in relation to religion's authority led to allowing the state to use religion as an instrument for securing something like the public peace and thus for securing its own authority as well, both by controlling the autonomous agency of those individuals who were agitating for democratization of state power, and on the other hand, by positing subjects as bearers of religious feeling, feelings that then became defined as an object of protection. Moving on to more recent decades, let's look briefly at this um, section 166 in its old and new versions, which is all under uh, number seven on the handout. <clears throat> 
So you see there, there's the, uh, the version that was enacted in 1871 for the Reich as a whole. The name of the, um, the crime is blasphemy, Gotteslästerung. And accompanying that, there's also the idea that, uh, that you must not insult a religious association. That's a, an additional offense that's named there, insult of a religious association. Since 1969, this uh, criminal law reform that happened in the Federal Republic, the, the crime in question is insulting of faiths, religious societies, and organizations dedicated to a philosophy of life. So the explicit crime of Gotteslästerung, blaspheming God, has been removed from the offense. The crime now is called insulting the content of someone's faith. That's how it's described. And um, something that we're not going to discuss, but that is, is, uh, is, is new here, is the Weltanschauungsvereinigungen, the, uh, the organizations dedicated to a philosophy of life that are also then protected but are not religious. In line with what I pointed out about the rationale behind the comeback of blasphemy laws in the 19th century, we see in both versions that the offense is a public one. In 1871, the blasphemy or insult is only a crime if it causes public ärgernis, scandal, nuisance. So that from a juridical standpoint, the object of protection is religion insofar as defaming religion could threaten the public order. Otherwise, a, public, a private utterance could also be punishable or perhaps the anti-Jewish symbolic images that can be found on some German churches, such as the the Judensau that we've been hearing a lot about in recent years would also be punishable. But as of 1969, uh, as of that reform version, this public order dimension is represented by the phrase capable of disturbing the public peace. Now, despite the fact that this new clause in the 1969 version seems to make newly explicit that public peace is the objective of the law, there are debates in the legal literature as to whether the object of protection of this law really can be something like public peace. And the reasons given for this are, for example, that although in the past attacks on religious belief led to serious social tensions, this is no longer imaginable today. And also it's often said that there is another statute, Volksverhetzung, incitement to, uh, to hatred, section 130 in the criminal code that covers, uh, that ought to cover um, religion insofar as it could incite violent acts against some group. There's also a view articulated by the legislators back in 1969 that the capable of clause represents not a requirement to protect public peace, but a requirement to foster an environment of tolerance. This capable of clause is supposed to ensure that what is protected from insult is not the creeds or beliefs of the members of these groups, the fact that criticism of religion, religious beliefs is permitted must then not be affected by this law. This brings me to the next aspect I want to consider, the relationship between blas blasphemy and criticism. That the opposition between blasphemy and criticism is often in play in contemporary discussions of blasphemy is a major focus of the essay by Talal Assad I just mentioned. Assad observes that it is routine in Euro-America to see the category of blasphemy as representing a conflict between the West as embodying the values of democracy, secularism, liberal, liberty, and reason, and Islam as embodying tyranny, religion, authority, and unreason, a grouping to which the category of blasphemy is, of course, taken to belong. Assad underscores that any attempt to get a conceptual handle on the category of blasphemy is going to have to contend with the question of how to differentiate it from the category of criticism or critique. A predominant strain of Western public discourse decries the call for protection of the sacred as a demand for censorship of any criticism of religious beliefs or practices, and laws against blasphemy typically include provisions to ensure that the freedom to criticize religion be maintained. This is exemplified by the reform of the 1969 with the clause that I just pointed to now, the capable of disturbing the public peace clause. Though some have argued that even the offense described in the 1871 version could not be mistaken for objective criticism since it already included the uh, insult of a religion. However, we'll see in a moment that what took place at the Marburg anti-Semitism trial in 1888 
seems to go against such an interpretation. Assad points out that the purported opposition between blasphemy and criticism becomes shaky, for example, when we consider that in connection with the Danish cartoons, some argued, quote, that it was even a good thing that pious Muslims felt injured because being hurt by criticism might provoke people to re-examine their beliefs, unquote. This idea of being hurt by criticism is a case in point for the analysis Assad provides of what our notion of criticism entails. He notes that there is both an affective dimension and a sociopolitical dimension to the flawed attempt to oppose criticism to blasphemy. While blasphemy is traditionally aligned with non-rational passion and criticism with objective rationality, Assad suggests that the distinction between them breaks down if we consider that criticism, under which he includes other activities like judging, censuring, finding fault, mocking, presupposes an affective asymmetry between the one performing the criticism and the object of the criticism. He further observes that while there is a Christian idea that one can blaspheme in thought as well as in deed, in Islam, a blasphemous act is necessarily public. This allows him to focus attention on a classic way of conceiving religiosity in the modern West, that internal belief has primacy over its externalizations, in contrast with the classic Islamic understanding of revelation as directed at legal and ethical rules, rather than at certainty of belief. Assad sums up this Muslim position on belief as follows, quote, what matters finally is belonging to particular ways of life in which the person does not own himself, unquote. Assad's contribution to thinking about blasphemy thus relies crucially on the non-Christian perspective he brings to bear on his topic, as well as on the fact that he's drawing on the experience of a minority religion that might lead to seeking protection from offense. The non-Christian perspective is key, not only because Assad's analysis is occasioned by specific experiences concerning the possible defamation of Islam, but because experiences, such experiences allow him to focus on how conceptions of blasphemy are informed by a Christian-centered understanding of religion and secularity. In view of the events of the last decades that have occasioned much, much writing about the legacy and future of blasphemy statutes in secular democracies, it can appear as though it is only relatively recently that Western states have had to confront demands of minority religions for legal protection from offense. I'm going to skip a few examples because I may be running out of time. It's thus instructive to look at the history of Section 166 and to do so from the vantage point of the plurality of religions and in particular of minority religions. In the historically bi-confessional German context, Section 166 was from its origins certainly understood as an instrument for easing tensions between Protestants and Catholics. This was part of what was at stake in construing public peace and religious feeling as objects of protection under that law. More importantly, as I mentioned, the history of Section 166 is coextensive with its use by at least one religious group, Jews, for anti-defamation purposes. Evidently, and I'll go back to, to number six here, the Prussian legislators in 1851 found it relevant to add to Section 135 the clause, quote, or another religious association with incorporation rights existing in the state. And this clause was retained in the 1871 Reich version. Thus the law extended to defamations of Judaism, or to be more precise, to the religion of the Jews as an officially recognized religious association in the Reich. In the 19th century sources I've looked at for reasons I've yet fully to understand, this consequence of the law's wording seems to be surprisingly uncontroversial. Returning for a moment to the question of the object of protection of this law, it can be useful to think of it in terms of the question, does it mandate protection of a universal good or on the other hand of a particular entity or group interest? Perhaps as some have suggested a blasphemy law or a religious defamation law is intelligible from the universalist standpoint of something like ensuring tolerance. However, it's not clear that the function or meaning of this law is actually to enrich the sense in which the minority is being recognized or given a place in Christian major majority society. Just as we saw in the mid 19th century, when public peace and religious feelings were introduced as merely intermediate objects of protection as a means of securing state power, so here tolerance would be a mechanism of determining the precise sense 
in which the identity in question qualifies as a recognized religious association and forms a part of the universal order of religions in their constitutional function. Thus, when we view section 166 from the point of view of minority religions, we can begin to see an asymmetry of the type Assad associates with Euro-American discourses concerning blasphemy, an asymmetry between the legal order and the tolerated religion. How section 166 works as a function of such tolerance can be illuminated if we look at the Marburg anti-Semitism trial of 1888, in which the philosopher Hermann Cohen served as an expert witness, even if the circumstances of that trial are in many ways dissimilar to contemporary scenarios in which this law might be invoked. As I mentioned, this is an early example of a trial in which this law was used as an instrument of Jewish legal defense to deal with the anti-Semitic attacks that grew out of the growing traction of anti-Semitism as a political movement in the 1880s. The accused was a school teacher who was reported to have claimed publicly at an anti-Semitic rally that the Talmud specified that Mosaic law is binding only for interactions among Jews and thus condones crimes against non-Jews. Such claims were quite typical of anti-Semitic polemics of the period, which routinely revived and popularized older Talmud denunciations whose purpose was to portray Jews as evildoers. A representative of the Marburg Jewish community documented what was said at the rally and brought it to the attention of authorities who subsequently initiated proceedings. Numerous similar cases were tried in the following years, and the sequence of events at, Mar of events at Marburg became formalized by the Zentralverein Deutscher Staatsbürger Jüdischen Glaubens, the society founded in 1893, as a Jewish organization, one of whose central tasks was anti-defamation work. The Zentralverein established a legal defense department whose job was to solicit and receive reports about anti-Semitic incidents in order to examine them for the purpose of seeking legal remedies where appropriate. If we look at the two questions posed by the court to Cohen as one of the expert witnesses, you'll recognize that they apply the criteria of, one, of section 166. So the first question is whether uh, the prescriptions contained in the Talmud pertaining to religious for, to religion or faith and to morals are to be regarded as binding commandments for believing Jews and an offense against or insult, an insult uh, of Talmud is to be regarded as an offense against the Jewish religious, uh, religious association or community or of an institution of the same. That's the first question. And the second is whether it says, whether the Talmud states Mosaic law is valid only between one Jew and another, it does not apply to Goyim who Jews may steal from and cheat. So that quote in there is a quotation of the claim attributed to the defendant, and it's, uh, the question is asking about its accuracy. It does not therefore seem to have been the view of the judge at the Marburg court that to determine whether insult had taken place in accordance with section 166, one could disregard whether the claim in question was true. The court called expert witnesses, one from each side as it were, one knowledgeable Jew, Hermann Cohen, and one notoriously anti-Semitic Orientalist, Paul de Lagarde, in order to examine whether the claim was, as we might call it, a legitimate criticism of Judaism, or whether it in fact amounted to defamation because it was untrue. <clears throat> we can see here an effective turning of the tables, which affects a breakdown, such as Assad has noted, of the purported opposition of blasphemy and criticism. The section 166 trial is premised on a recognized religion, Judaism, being an object of protection. But by asking the expert witnesses, and especially the expert witness who has been called to tell the truth about Judaism, whether the potentially defamatory claim made by the accused is accurate, we find in effect that it is Judaism that is being put on trial for its purported hostility to Christians. This section 166 trial thus becomes an adjudication of historic Christian accusations against Judaism. Cohen's assigned task in the Marburg courtroom was to demonstrate that the particular ethical code of Judaism measured up to the standard of universality. <clears throat> that is, whether Jewish law mandates just treatment of all, regardless of religion. In his testimony, Cohen responds to this on one level by affirming Judaism's universalism. He shows in detail 
that the Levitical precept <clears throat> to love your neighbor applies not only to members of one's own tribe or faith, but to all human beings. In other words, that the Talmud and Judaism requires ethical treatment of non-Jews. Cohen's demonstration thus also implicitly counters the prejudice that love of neighbor is an invention of the New Testament. However, if, one look, if we look further <clears throat> at, the truck, at the structure and argumentation of Cohen's affidavit, we can see him also calling into question the discursive framework that enables this implicit trial of Judaism's code of conduct toward non-Jews. <clears throat> Cohen prefaces his direct answers to the court's questions with a combined argument about the method of philosophy and against Christian supersessionist ideas about morality. Regarding philosophy, Cohen concedes that religious ideas might be at the origin of moral ideas, but argues that the philosopher's task is to give those ideas their proper begründung, foundation, grounding, and to correct them accordingly, freed from the constraints of the positive religions and theologies. Thus, while philosophy is in, this, in a sense dependent on theology, its task is to work out an ethics that is methodologically autonomous. But at the same time, Cohen argues, philosophy's traditional dependence on theology, from which it must free itself, means that it inherits and risks perpetuating theological prejudices around, about religious moral systems, as he puts it here in the next quote under number nine, in terms of the hierarchy of moral ideas. Quote, the hierarchy of religions is supposed to correspond to their position in relation to the moral ideas, not to the foundation of those moral ideas, but to their plain content. This is how it came to pass that universal human morality was denied not only to the Talmud, but also to its very source, the ancient covenant, the basic form of monotheistic morality, love of neighbor. Cohen here effectively reads the courtroom situation as one in which he's being called upon to certify the established hierarchy of religions, which is commonly held to correspond to their relative moral value, meaning in the context of the trial, the relative moral value of Judaism and Christianity in terms of the plain content of their moral ideas, as opposed to what philosophy is concerned with, the task of begründung, founding or conceptually accounting for or reasoning about those moral ideas. I take Cohen here to be demonstratively bypassing the court's question, which calls for comparison of the ethical content of Judaism and Christianity by posing an empirical question about Talmudic morality. Does the Talmud really say such and such? Cohen redirects, redirects the inquiry from one which would be designed to show how the Jewish religion could be harmonized with a hegemonic universal morality to an inquiry into the grounding of morality as such. In this sense, we may say that Cohen is opting out of what the political theorist Wendy Brown, treating modern and contemporary Western attitudes toward religious and cultural difference, has called tolerance discourse. Building on the observation that tolerance as a public or political discourse must mark its object as deviant, marginal, or undesirable by virtue of being tolerated, Brown argues that tolerance discourse is a strand of depoliticization in liberal democracies that presupposes a naturalization or essentializing of group conflict. This conflict in turn calls for practices of tolerance to harmonize over the differences between the group identities. Thus the notion of tolerance presupposes and produces as naturally pre-existing the conflicts that it is supposedly designed to address. Above all, that between cultural particularity and universality. Tolerance discourse then posits a universality with respect to which the object to be, tolerate, to, to be tolerated functions as a particular. Drawing on this analysis, we can say that when the Marburg court called for a statement as to whether the defendant's alleged claim that the Talmud sanctions wrongdoing toward non-Jews was true, a juridical discursive framework was produced in which, depending on the answer to that question, the particular Jewish ethical code could either be reconciled with or tolerated by the universal order or be found lacking. In answering explicitly as a philosopher and refusing to engage in a comparison of ethical contents, Cohen refuses tolerance discourse. Here, Judaism is cast not as a particularity that is making a bid for tolerance by the Christian order. Rather, what Cohen winds up presenting and defending under the heading Love of Neighbor and the Talmud, which is the title he gave his affidavit, is a moral system that is constitutive of ethical universality as such, and thus disrupts the hierarchy of religions 
and the tolerance paradigm represented by the institution of the Section 166 trial. I'm going to skip uh, the uh, number 10 here, which you can leave, read on your own. They are key verses that Cohen develops his theory of love of neighbor uh, on. And I'll say just that um, his interpretation of the, uh, the, the, the neighbor refers to, uh, the neighbor love is really a universal ethics, is part of his larger argument for a politics of universality to be realized in our time. As he writes in one of his subsequent neighbor essays, and this is the last quote on the handout, number 11, quote, it was not by way of a pedantic haggling as to how much difference could be at best tolerated. And on the other hand, what minimal degree of unity one ought simply to demand, not in other words, in so external a mechanics that such an idea, namely neighbor love, which more than any other ideas of the human spirit has the imprint of a unified idea, could have come about." Unquote. Cohen's intervention at this historic anti-Semitism trial returns us to Assad's reflections on blasphemy and criticism. In that essay, Assad recalls, as he does in other works, the Christian ecclesiastical roots of purportedly secular authority, the order of secularity that calls for the religious minority to get past religion in the name of free secular criticism. The Marburg trial indeed exposes the opposition between blasphemy and criticism as untenable. Using Assad's analysis, we can see Cohen as undoing the affective asymmetry of the secularized blasphemy statute. Cohen sidesteps the challenge to demonstrate neighbor love as an intelligible and legitimate object of protection. Instead, his argument for recognizing the Jewish origination of the universal imperative to love the neighbor who is first and foremost a stranger, indeed calls for the law of protection to transcend itself toward a more fundamental, genuine hospitality. Thank you. <laughs>